Great. Thank you. And thank you for inviting me. And this has been such an amazing session. And uh, uh, it's a difficult act to follow, particularly from the four speakers we've just had. So I'm going to tell you about therapies for Huntington's disease. So I work on Huntington's disease. It's a devastating neurodegenerative disease, affects people when they're young. The typical onset is age 40 and it's monogenic. It's the world's most common genetic dementia. It's caused by a repeat expansion in the first exon of the Huntington gene and disease is through a predominant toxic gain of function of the mutant protein. And so this is from a re recent review I did, and it's really fo uh, there are many approaches in development, but I'm going to focus today on antisense oligonucleotides, as, as John mentioned, and also on zinc finger protein transcriptional repressors. And so ASOs are single strands of chemically modified DNA. And ASOs are designed to bind very specifically to their cognate mRNA. And in the case of Huntington's, they bind to the Huntington mRNA through precise Watson and Crick based pairing. And that leads to a hybrid that results in degradation through the RNA's H1 mechanism. And the result of that is you get less translation and less of the toxic protein being made. Now, ASOs, even though they're uh, oligonucleotides, are chemically modified to allow them to cross cell membranes. You can titrate them to the dose. They're stable and the effects are reversible. Now, ASOs, MOE ASOs, don't cross the blood brain barrier, so they need to be given intrathecally through a lumbar puncture. And fortunately, they have long half lives that allows infrequent dosing. And so I'm just going to briefly tell you the background to the program. It started in 2005 by Frank Bennett and Don Cleveland with the original uh, mouse HD work. I then became involved in 2010 and it was a 10 year preclinical program. And between 2010 and 2015, I, we were very involved in designing the preclinical and large animal work to, to, in order to be able to take this to patients. And so in 2015, in September, we started the first in human multiple ascending dose study. We had five dose levels versus placebo with three to one active to placebo. And we developed a fast push intrathecal bolus injection with 20 mils fast push bolus. The primary objective was safety and tolerability, and we didn't know whether in this short, small study we would get any evidence of target engagement in would the ASO get to the brain, would it engage with the Huntington transcript and lower the level of the protein. Patients were dosed three times over, uh, four times over three months and then followed up for four months, so it was a short seven-month study. This was the uh, result that uh, got people excited because it was the first demonstration of an ASO being delivered to the brains of patients, adult patients with a neurodegenerative disease to lower the level of a toxic protein. And it's resulted in many ASO trials that are now in development or in the clinic. And so this graph shows you that at the higher doses of 90 and 120 milligrams, we got between 40 and 60% lowering of our target CSF mutant Huntington. This was a PKPD model, and this was uh, generated in non-human primates to really tell us more about what was happening in brain parenchyma. And from this model, 40% lowering in CSF is expected to give 55 to 70% lowering in the cortex, 20 to 35% in the deep tissue of the caudate, 60% is expected to give 70 to 85%, and 35 to 50% in the deep tissue. And that magnitude of reduction is, exceeds what we know reverses symptoms in HD animal models, which is about 30 to 50% mutant Huntington lowering. So I'm now going to show you some insights from the 15 month OLE data. So all of those subjects in the original phase one were rolled over into an open label extension. They were randomized to re receive 120 milligrams every four weeks or 120 milligrams every eight weeks. And these graphs show you that it, with the four weekly regime, we got a 70% mean trough lowering with a target range was 30 to 50% lowering in CSF mutant Huntington because we're lowering total Huntington. 
In the eight-weekly cohort, there was a 44% mean trough lowering, and the target range was 30 to 50%. And the data shows that eight-weekly dosing is sufficient to reach our target CSF mutant Huntington reduction. Now, this is a busy slide, but it's really giving you the adverse events that were occurring. The bottom line is that there were many more adverse events in monthly dosing over 15 months. And if you just focus on the red boxes, in the eight-weekly cohort, there were only 2% of adverse events considered drug-related, no uh, uh, serious adverse events, and no SUSARs. And the data really supported that eight-weekly was much better tolerated than monthly dosing. And I think this is important learning for ASO trials. Also, unexpectedly, and this is what when we're, one is doing a, a potentially innovative disease-modifying uh, trial, sometimes you get results that are unexpected. What we found was CSF NFL actually increased in both the four-weekly and the eight-weekly arm. Now, it, it uh, increased at about day four, 141 in both arms, and then in the eight-weekly arm, it came back down at 15 months to baseline and to what was compared in the untreated sample in untreated cohort. So orange is what the untreated patients in the HD natural history study show. It's about a 15% increase in CSF NFL over 15 months. So it, ra it rose and then it came back down to expected baseline. Now, the mechanism underlying this NFL increase is currently under a lot of investigation. It could be on target, it could be off target, it could be an ASO chemical effect. And this is, uh, watch this space. So the study that then this uh, phase one and the OLE rolled into was the Generation HD1 study. Now this is the phase three study. And this study will evaluate the efficacy and safety of intrathecally administered tominersen, the ASO is now called tominersen, in adult patients with symptomatic manifest Huntington's disease. This is the largest recruited ASO study in the world. It's 791 subjects, 100 sites, and 18 countries. And it's going to compare Tominersen 120 milligrams every eight weeks with Tominersen 120 milligrams every 16 weeks versus placebo for two years. And this study will tell us whether it's safe and whether it slows progression by the time people have active manifest disease. We don't know the best time to treat yet, and we're planning pre-manifest trials in case it's important, and I think this may be the case, that we have to treat even earlier. This is the overall clinical development plan, and the one, um, uh, I, one a point I want to bring to your attention, we have been following a cohort of HD natural history study patients, and they are all rolling into the Generation Extend open label where they will receive the drug every two months or every four months. But importantly, with this cohort, they have not had the loading doses. And so we're interested in the data as we get this to see if the reducing the loading doses reduces that NFL spike at day 141. So this is going to be a very important result from the natural history study into Gen Extend, and we hope to have that in the next few months. We're also working on targeting single nucleotide polymorphisms, and that will reduce expression of the mutant protein only. Now, programs are in development at Ionis and WAVE. Now, this is personalized genomic medicine, and it can only target those carrying the SNPs, which are predominantly in people of Western origin. The SNPs will treat a subset of the HD population, and in order to treat all of the HD population, you're going to need to develop five to six different ASOs and different drugs, all of which will be treated independently. So this is the way that the antisense approach targets SNPs. You can then design antisense against SNPs that are linked to the CAG expansion. Now, this is the approach that WAVE are developing. Now, WAVE have two trials targeting two SNPs, one and 
SNP one and SNP two. They have a third in development. They announced early results um, last year showing that they got 12% CSF mutant Huntington lowering with the 16 milligram dose. And now they've increased the dose to a 32 milligram cohort. And we expect to see the results in spring of 2021. And we're going to be interested uh, uh, and to see what these important results will show. And just to, in the final few minutes, I'm going to tell you about a new program that I've been working on in the last four years. And this is a transcriptional repressor ZFP allele selective gene therapy program that I'm, I'm actually very excited about. So gene therapy is a technique that uses genetic material to treat or prevent disease. You need to encapsulate a DNA expression cassette in a viral capsid, and that's then injected into a patient and you get pro continuous production of a therapeutic molecule. For the brain, we use an AAV delivery. So the gene therapy is uh, 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 injected with an AAV vector, and that then produces the protein that makes the new material. So engineered ZFPs for allele-specific repression of mutant Huntington transcription. So this is targeting Huntington DNA. And the reason that's important is it's going to target every downstream pathogenic um, uh, pathway. It's going to target full-length mutant Huntington, and it's also going to target the toxic exon 1 transcript. The ZFP has been engineered to preferentially bind longer CHU repeats and promote the recruitment of multiple ZFP rep fusion proteins at the expanded disease allele. The rep functional domain inhibits transcription when it's recruited to the Huntington gene by the ZFP. And basically, the ZFP, the rep fusion domain, switches off the transcription start site, and so you don't get transcription at all. This will also, we hope, target somatic expansion of the Huntington CAG, where we know that if we switch off Huntington transcription, we don't get somatic expansion. This is now in late preclinical development. Uh, Sangamo published uh, their data in, in mouse models, and what they found was the zinc finger protein lowered mutant Huntington very selectively. You can see up here in Q175 neurons, it reversed nuclear and perinuclear inclusions, and also reversed the PD10 PET signal in the striatum using micropet and HD mice. This was with a striatal injection. So the the program has now been taken over by Takeda, which is great news, and we're hoping to take it into a first-in-human study. There's been a detailed screening that's uh, been ongoing, and the top AAV ZFP transcriptional repressor candidate has been selected based on the pharmacology in HD mouse models, and that's TAC-686. You get a dose-dependent reduction of soluble mutant protein, which persists for at least 33 weeks after a single dose of TAC-666 in Q71, Q175 knock-in mice. And so what's the roadmap? The therapeutic goal for this with gene therapy is that this will be a single administration to slow down disease progression by lowering mutant Huntington only via a direct intraparenchymal infusion into the brain. Now, AAV gene therapy approaches like this can only target relatively small regions of the brain. Antisense oligonucleotides that I showed you have a cortical predominant pharmacodynamic effect, i.e. they lower their target mostly in the cortex with some penetration to the deep structures. Gene therapy can only be injected into specific regions, and at the moment, it's really just targeting the striatum, although we hope that there's going to be some retrograde transport to the cortex. This is being looked at in large animal studies at the moment. We're planning to target adult early stage patients in our first in human. The primary endpoint is going to be safety. It's going to be administered via MRI-guided convection-enhanced delivery to the caudate and the putamen. And I'm working up the protocol now with Ludwig Zringo and Steve Gill, two functional neurosurgeons in the UK who will be leading on helping deliver the gene therapy to our patients. 
The large animal distribution work is ongoing and the IND enabling GLP tox study is currently ongoing and I'm hoping we will be able to start the first in human study in early 2022. So I think all of my work and I'm involved in many different approaches and this is just a 15 minute snapshot, but I really hope uh, in the next 10 years that we can do clinical trials in young HD gene carriers who are 20 to 30 years before symptom onset. And I think with that, I think we have our real hope for the future in terms of being able to prevent this disease ever occurring. And we just recently published in the Lancet Neurology a cohort of individuals 24 years before onset that is going to help us build the groundwork to allow us to do these sorts of trials. So that's what I hope for the future. I'd like to thank you for listening and I'm very happy to take any questions. Thank you, Sarah. That was a Beautifully clear presentation. Thank you very much indeed. Um, you've got a couple of questions. Um, so first of all, there's a question about optimizing the tominersin uh, therapy and whether you it will be um, necessary to take into account the number of polyglutamine repeats for dose optimization. It's a good question. So um, the antibody that detects CSF mutant Huntington uh, is a 2B7MW1 antibody combination. And that antibody combination um, binds uh, uh, more specifically to longer CAG repeats. So um, uh, there has been a lot of interrogation of, of if you get more lo uh, perceived lowering with longer repeats. But because Tominersen is designed to bind um, uh, quite upstream, it's an exon upstream of the CAG repeat region, um, it, the, it's, it won't target any um, uh, around the CAG at all. So, um, but therapies like the uh, zinc finger will, um, uh, are very much bind to longer CAG repeats, so you get tighter binding the longer CAG repeats. So for the zinc finger, that would be the case, but Tominersen binds um, very much upstream of exon 1 where their CAG repeat is and uh, won't affect that. Okay, thanks. Um, there's a question in the chat about the um, differences in the dynamics or magnitude of the transient C CSF NFL increase between the four week and the eight week OLE subjects? Yeah, so the four week um, CSF spike was higher. They got the four weekly cohort have got more ASO because they've been getting it monthly. And uh, the four weekly cohort um, uh, reduced back down, but didn't come back quite back down to baseline. But I think the important thing about the data is that when, and this is going to be important for ASO learning, we found that monthly dosing of an ASO was just not very well tolerated in terms of adverse events, serious adverse events, and it was just too much ASO and too many lumbar punches. So the four weekly cohort was terminated. The, uh, and the phase three trial is comparing eight weekly cohort with a 16 weekly cohort. So that means two months every four months. And um, it was good that the uh, NFL came back down to baseline. I think we're gonna have to see if it goes below baseline. I think what happens in the four uh, monthly uh, dosed cohorts gonna be important. And I'm also interested, very importantly, what happens with those in the natural history study that rolled over into the open label extension who did not get ASO loading. So there is a, um, in pharmacology, people want to try and get the maximum dose as quickly as possible. So in the first studies, there are all been um, ASO loading doses over a few months. We, st we didn't do the loading when we've rolled natural history into open label extension. And we're interested to see if without loading, whether you reduce that NFL. Um, uh, so, as I mentioned, I we don't know the cause, but, you know, ASOs are, are um, uh, very hydrophobic, they're pro-inflammatory, so uh, it might be a case of too much ASO and uh, uh, we're going to have to titrate the dose um, to, to prevent the NFL spike. But as I say, the natural history study going into Gen Extend is going to give us some important information. But I, I wanted to illustrate it because it's, it shows you, you know, you're always learning. 
we're going to learn all the way through whatever the result of generation HD1 we're going to learn about uh, 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 how ASOs behave in a large population and also by the time people have developed symptoms of the disease um, how tractable it is in terms of reversing neurodegeneration or slowing neurodegeneration when we know we're, we're, we're targeting um, mutant Huntington. So thank you. So that brings us nicely to the end of the time slot.